There is a thin line that separates cult from religion. Some people, who are much more radical than I am, would even compare mainstream religions like Christianity to well-known cults around the world. So, what chance does some strange man in a robe rambling in tongues have at being accepted by the general public? Well, every item on a list should be one deadly reason why you should never trust one of these snake oil salesmen. These are the most haunting cults. Number 1. The Unification Church Many young people seek fruitlessly to fit in with their peers. This is a constant struggle in high school especially, where the desire for a positive reputation among peers is one of particular contention. In high school, to be abnormal is to be an undesirable. Any student who missed the mark on the delicate task of fitting within accepted norms was fodder for bullying, and their standing was that of an outcast with fellow classmates. The Unification Church, however, makes the most unassuming and conformative cliques and groups look like circuses filled with bizarre carnies in comparison. At the hearts of the Unification Church is a man named Reverend Sun Myung Moon, a stranger that believes he was chosen by the divine Christian Messiah Jesus Christ to continue his work into the next life. He believes it is his sole duty to get his moonies to follow his exact word to a T. Every man, woman, or child must follow his strict codes and act identically to one another, or salvation will be out of their hands. Salvation, according to these moonies, can only be done if you maintain strict obedience to Sun Ming Moon's words. This stringent shepherd picks out spouses for each of his congregation and hosts his weird mass weddings in order to exact his particular and peculiar vision upon his unquestioning followers. Despite this clear dictatorial grasp Moon held over his congregation, this massive cult has achieved a great following since the 1970s. Long after people became aware of these brainwashing tactics and the process of deprogramming, the cult still continued to gain popularity. A disturbing consequence of the effectiveness of the church's brainwashing is the resistance exhibited by cult members receiving treatment to restore their minds after leaving the church. The now rebranded Family Federation for World Peace and Unification continues to focus on convincing more children and young people to join the cult with promises of acceptance, a very dangerous but effective tactic amongst those with a strong desire to fit in. Rajneesh Puram Imagine a man who has it all, a man driven by lust with a network of a sprawling shantytown vying to sate him. Cult guru Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh was just that kind of man. He was enamored by sex, cars, and money, leading him to lead the life of a spiritualist in order to con his followers and satisfy his greed. In the 1970s, he started his own cult, raised enough money to buy over 93 Rolls Royces, and created a group of religious zealots known as neo sanniasins The cult itself encouraged women to be more promiscuous, being especially obliged to suggestion by young male counterparts. Sexual acts were highly encouraged to a point of expectation. In the past, these people used to go by a different name, the colorful and mysterious orange people. This was due to the orange clothing they wore, later being replaced by red and pink, though these garbs were common only between 1970 and 1985, due to the fact that his troubling teachings left him at odds with local communities and the highly conservative Indian government. He was forced to leave his homeland, deciding then to buy a good chunk of land from the United States. Rajneesh Puram had begun a strange cult community, casually referred to as Tent City, located in Wasco County, Oregon. For a short breath of time, it had even been incorporated as a city in the 1980s, populated exclusively by the cult members. The city itself was 64,229 acres and located in central Oregon, bought at the low price of $5.75 million, $14.3 million when adjusted for inflation. In a period of only three years, the community had grown into 7,000 people and even started to develop civil services and infrastructure such as police, restaurants, malls, and even a fire department. Public transportation and even their own zip code followed soon after. Tent City, however, had become entrenched in a large set of legal battles with neighboring communities. 
The catalyst of this conflict was the fact that their land had been previously zoned for agricultural use. Since then, the Rajneesh Puram had bought the land under the pretense of using it for agriculture endeavors, but instead used it for residential, urban, and industrial use. The group seemed to be more interested in getting involved in politics and creating an actual city rather than a small farming community, presenting unintended competition with local businesses. The tensions between the cult and local communities would come to a boil in the city of Antelope, Oregon, where several of Rajneesh's followers would bring a small number of lots in Antelope with the intention of spreading and enterprising. Due to a dispute with the 1,000 Friends of Oregon, cult members were denied business permits, necessitating that the small town of 50 people be flooded with Rajneesh's followers. In 1982, Antelope held a vote to disincorporate itself from Tent City. However, it was too late. Too many of Rajneesh's people have moved and swayed the vote to incorporate this small city onto the separate city of Rajneesh Puram. They further use this newfound power to discriminate against various other religious groups. In June 1983, a Rajneesh hotel was bombed and, in retaliation, various pictures of Rajneesh's followers wielding semi-automatic weapons started to surface. It was clear these people wanted to start violence and stakes continued to rise until the National Guard was called upon to arrest the cult leader. Meanwhile, the rest of their community leaders dealt with further legal battles which culminated in the federal government invalidation of various attempts to expand the city. Cult followers believed the government was bigoted when they prevented them from forming these religious city-states which allowed for discrimination of other people. Alas, after one of the biggest investigations of Oregon history, they learned that the church was victim to political intrigue where several members attempted to kill one another which led to plenty of members being extradited, continuing dangerous instances of arson and wiretapping. Sheila, a member of the cult from Germany, even went as far as to infect the salad bars of several restaurants in Dales, infecting 751 with salmonella. The Big Money Ranch which once hosted this city went bankrupt and is now a Christian youth camp. The Branch Davidians This particular reform of the Protestant faith is a terrifying reminder of how much the power of fear of the end times can have on a group of people. Self-proclaimed prophet David Koresh expanded upon the works of Victor Hutep, a Bulgarian convert to the Seventh-day Adventism, who went on to publish a list of reforms named The Shepherd's Rod. These tracts warned that the coming of Christ would soon be upon them and would soon result in a schism from which the Branch Davidians would emerge. In the March of 1959, hundreds of believers would gather in the Texas Center to bear witness to the Second Coming. However, the inaccuracy of this prediction led to the group splintering. Ben Rodin would be the next in power over the group promising that the second coming would indeed arrive after his followers reach a state of moral maturity? Rodin led the community of Davidians onto Mount Carmel, where a young convert by the name of Vernon Howell would soon establish control and change his name to the aforementioned David Koresh. David Koresh saw himself as a prophet, a messiah, and soon would prove that absolute power corrupts absolutely. Using fear and coercion, he began taking unmarried females of the community as wives. He prophesied a new revelation, which he called the New Lot, claiming that he should father a new population, which would inherit the kingdom of God and also serve as a catalyst for the end times. Dissolving all marriages in the community by 1992, Koresh staked his claim to the Davidian women, even sexually abusing girls as young as 12 years old while men in the community chose to enter a life of celibacy. Due to his claim of teenage spiritual wives, Koresh eventually was pressed with child abuse charges. This attracted the attention of the authorities when an ex-member fought for custody of his daughter. A year later, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Agency requested a search warrant for Mount Carmel due to alleged possession of weapons and of violent apocalyptic teachings of the Davidians. 
Based on these circumstances, the ATF decided to make a surprise force entry. The raid by the ATF was met with a prolonged firefight which lasted for 45 minutes and incurred heavy casualties on both sides. The situation was adopted by the FBI afterwards who engaged in a standoff lasting 7 weeks wherein they attempted to negotiate with a branch of Davidians via telephone which made no progress. Eventually, a second assault was mounted using tear gas grenades. Rather than surrender, however, the branch lit their own compound on fire. 80 members died in this fateful blaze, which included 22 children and the Messiah, David Koresh himself. The Children of Thunder Few methods of indoctrination and coercion are as effective as an alleged voice to a supernatural force or forces. Mankind is preceded by a fear of the unknown and of death and the afterlife specifically. This is a crucial, critical weakness which can be exploited by anyone who claims to be more than what their morality would suggest. Though Glenn Taylor Helzer believed himself to be just that, a vessel through which gods and other spirits could speak. He used fear and theatrics to control his congregation, which he quickly attracted with his reforms to the Mormon doctrine. The Helzer brothers, Justin and Glenn, were as eccentric as they come. Glenn was described as a particularly charismatic individual and was accomplished as a stockbroker before his mental breakdown after a mission to Brazil. Drugs, alcohol, and other illegal substances clouded his mind, and soon after, the man left his wife and children. In the year 1998, the two brothers were excommunicated from the church for a year due to extremist and violent behavior and of course drug abuse we only can speculate but it's generally believed that this action is what led to the disconnect between Glenn's cult and traditional church at an event hosted by their church in 1999 the brothers met up with credulous character known as Don Goodman Goodman was haunted by her failed marriage and addiction to amphetamines, eventually leading to a botched suicide attempt. At Glenn's recommendation, Don was convinced to attend Impact Session, hosted by a group called Impact America. This dangerously destructive self-help group hosted intense sessions designed to emotionally pummel and humiliate those who would attend in order to rebuild them into something better. Glenn confessed during one of these sessions that he spoke for God, and if you were not devoted to him, he would have to kill you. According to Goodman, he shut everyone in the room up, as opposed to have thrown insults at him, like normal sessions. The stakes would only raise from that point forward, sending Goodman and other vulnerable individuals down a dark path marked by bloodlust and delusions of grandeur. The drug crazed group eventually took part in a sick, shared ideal that they needed to murder in the name of God, and that these killings would expedite the second coming of Christ. The party slaughtered, dismembered, and brutally murdered many people. The three eventually were sent to prison, though Goodman and Justin would choose to testify against Glenn for a reduced sentence. Glenn, Taylor, Helzer, holy prophet of the children of thunder, died by his own hand, hanging from the neck until his death in 2013 in a California state prison. The Fall River's Cult In the 1960s, notorious cults and fringe religious sects surged in size and influence. 
This led to a backlash from the Christian fundamentalist community and the equally destructive anti-cult movement. The constant fear-mongering of this movement eventually came to a head in a cultural phenomenon now referred to as the Satanic Panic. While there was a right and justifiable fear of satanic cults beforehand who were infamous for violent and sexually aggressive practices, the satanic panic could only be described as a witch hunt where public hysteria led to a series of wild and unfounded accusations carried out by otherwise rational people. There was an intense public backlash against anything that remotely resembled satanism and a fair amount of people who were in no way connected to any cult movements. Carl Drew exploited the fear of Satanism by casting himself in the role of a cult leader. This allowed him to achieve a new level of fear and coercion amongst the members of his cult, who also doubled as his prostitutes. He used Satanist practices to intimidate his hookers, keeping them in line by claiming to be the very son of Satan himself. He began hosting Satanic rituals in nearby woods where young girls were sacrificed to the devil in violent ceremonies with copious sex and drugs thrown into the mix. Eventually, the discovery of the remains of girls in those woods made headlines, leading to an investigation by Massachusetts police. One of the victims was discovered with their wrists tied with fishing line and left her body under bleachers at a high school. Her head had been brutalized with a rock and she had been raped. One of the prostitutes, Karen Marsden, had escaped Drew and was acting as an informant for the police. Her testimonies were called into question, however, due to her heavy exposure to drugs disparring her reliability as a witness. Eventually, the top half of Marsden's skull was discovered in the nearby Westport Beach alongside clumps of hair, a high-heeled shoe, and pieces ripped from a woman's sweater. It would seem that Drew did not approve of her testimony indeed. After a short string of murders, Carl Drew was brought to justice and is now serving a life in prison. There are some who even go so far as to say that the Fall River cult never existed, that it was merely a product of satanic panic. The Church of Scientology The scary thing about the Church of Scientology is that they wield quite a bit of influence. Former members tell stories of brainwashing, fraud, and attempts at financial ruin. On top of suing anyone who speaks ill of the Scientology name, they've even infiltrated the United States' government. Operation Snow White took place during the 1970s, and is regarded as one of the largest infiltrations of the US government in history. They've infiltrated more than 136 government agencies, with as many as 5,000 convert agents. They destroyed any document that presented the group in a negative light. The Ripper Crew The Ripper Crew was a group of four young men, led by Robert Getch. Beginning in 1981, they murdered 18 women as part of a satanic sacrifice. But there's a bit of a twist to this one. Their satanic ceremony consisted of kidnapping a woman, taking turns raping the woman, after which they would cut off her breast with a piano wire. Then they masturbated onto the amputated breast before eating it. All done while Gretsch was reading from the Satanic Bible. On December 6th, 1982, a woman was found near the railroad tracks. In addition to other injuries, her left breast had been amputated and her right breast was severely slashed. Against all odds, she survived the attacks and was able to give a description about her attackers and the van they had used to abduct her. Some members were sentenced to death, and the others would spend the rest of their lives in prison. The Santa Muerta Cult Santa Muerta, or Saint Death, is a folklore saint in Mexican culture. She is the personification of death that helps people on their journey in the afterlife. Silvia Meraz started a cult dedicated to the worship of Santa Muerta. And after the disappearances of three people, police investigated Meraz's house. They found the bodies of three victims, two of which were ten-year-old boys. It was confessed 
that the wrists and throats of the victims were slit, and the blood was drained and then poured around the altar of Santa Muerta. The People's Temple Growing up, Jim Jones was noted as being a weird and reclusive kid. People that grew up around him noted that he was obsessed with religion and death, one even claiming that he sacrificed a cat. Considering he was also greatly influenced by Mao, Hitler, and Stalin, and you can start to understand why he would eventually establish a communist cult that ended in a mass suicide. He founded the People's Temple in 1955, which adopted many core values from Christianity, radical socialism, and racial equality. The movement gained quite a bit of traction with as many as 20,000 members and connections to left-wing politicians. In the 70s, large portions of the cults relocated to Guyana, which is located in South America. There were roughly 1,000 people in Jonestown, largely being made up of children, and idealistic young people. On November 17th, Congressman Leo Ryan was investigating the self-described socialist utopia. Ryan made claims that there was abuse taking place, and as he left back to the US, he was gunned down by the People's Temple's security force. The next day, realizing his following wouldn't survive law enforcement, Jim Jones ordered all of his residents of Jonestown to drink Kool-Aid. Little did they know, it was laced with cyanide. If you've ever heard the phrase drinking the Kool-Aid, this is where that phrase comes from. Alm Shinrikyo In 1984, a man named Shoko Asahara started a small yoga and meditation class out of his one-bedroom apartment in Tokyo. He began integrating a mishmash of Christian and Buddhist philosophy and soon began to attract students from some of Japan's prestigious universities. So far, nothing so unusual. In 1989, Asahara's movement, which would come to be known to the world as Aum Shinrikyo, gained the status of an official religion, continuing to cater to intellectual elites and while their existence might have been a bit controversial, the car was still on the rails. Then, in the early 90s, Asahara started to become obsessed with biblical prophecies. Rumors began to leak out of people being held against their will by the organization and being subject to the kind of harsh indoctrination tactics we are all well familiar with by now. Former members reported being charged incredibly stiff fees upon being admitted to groups' private hospitals, and an anti-cult lawyer who had been investigating the group disappeared along with his wife and child. Things were coming to a head by 1995, and it seemed as if government investigations might begin to yield criminal charges, so Aum Shinrikyo decided that major and drastic action needed to be taken. Unbeknownst to most outside of the group, there had been two major developments which had taken place in the early 90s. First, Asahara was going full-on apocalyptic, believing that the United States was going to start World War III in 1997 and that only cult members would survive the coming Armageddon. Second, he had begun stockpiling and testing weapons rarely seen outside of well-supplied terrorist groups. Aum Shinrikyo was becoming increasingly militarized, and although they were feeling the pressure of government interference, the government in actuality had absolutely no idea just how completely batshit their doctrine had become. At the end of 1993, the cult began manufacturing the infamous nerve gas sarin, and in 1994, they gave it a test run. On the night of June 27th, the cult used a modified refrigerator truck to spread a cloud of sarin throughout the central Japanese city of Matsumoto. Seven were killed and 500 sickened, and you would think this would have brought the cult's deadly activities to light. You would think wrong. Japanese police, unskilled in the ancient art of finding their asses with both hands, focused their entire investigation on an innocent man and the cult escaped suspicion for the Matsumoto incident. Unfortunately, it was just a warm-up. On March 20th, he ordered a coordinated attack on five separate Tokyo subway trains, possibly as a diversion, in an incident that would go down in history as the worst terrorist attack ever on Japanese soil. 
At the time, it was the deadliest disaster of any kind since the end of the Second World War. 12 people died and 50 were severely injured, and if the incident was meant to divert the police from conducting their raids, it backfired spectacularly. They brought the hammer down, conducting massive and simultaneous raids on Um Shinrikyo compounds across Japan, and not a damn moment too soon. They found ingredients for enough sarin to kill 4 million people, and that was just the tip of the iceberg. Further chemical stockpiles could have been used to manufacture LSD, a crude truth serum, and methamphetamine. Millions of US dollars in cash and gold were also found, not to mention live prisoners, tons of explosive, and a goddamn military helicopter. Initial reports suggested that biological agents such as Ebola and anthrax were also discovered, but they may have been exaggerated. A rash of smaller, isolated incidents followed. The chief of the national police was shot four times near his home, the head of the Ministry of Science was stabbed in public, and, most significantly, a cyanide bomb was found and disabled in a busy train station. If it hadn't been discovered, it could have killed up to 10,000 people. Asahara was found in hiding and arrested a couple months after the subway attacks, and more top cult officials followed like dominoes. The group splintered off into smaller factions that are still being watched closely by the government, and as of today, 13 of its members, including Asahara, remain on death row. The Manson Family Ask anyone to name some of the most notorious serial killers they can think of. And most people will come up with Charles Manson. The utterly creepy truth is that Manson himself never killed anybody. At least, so far as we know. All of the murders that the Manson family are known to be responsible for were carried out by others, who were manipulated by Manson into doing his bidding. Before Manson and his band of weirdos devolved into sheer lunacy and brutal murder, they were just another band of hippies among thousands of similar odd bands of hippies that popped up like dandelions throughout the late 60s. Manson was described by those who knew him as nice, polite, and extremely charismatic. Many think that the family's downward spiral began with what would have been an awesome encounter for any band of hippies. In 1968, two female members of the Manson family were picked up as hitchhikers by Dennis Wilson, a drummer for the Beach Boys. He let the girls hang out at his house while he went to go record some tunes, and when he came back, Manson and a dozen family members had pretty much moved in. Most people wouldn't be cool with this, but the family hung out for a few months and even doubled in number, perhaps because of all the cute hippie chicks who acted as servants to Wilson and Manson. Wilson even introduced old Charlie to a friend who was interested in Manson's music, record producer Terry Melcher. Remember that name. Wilson paid for Manson to record several of his songs which would eventually become, with different lyrics, the Beach Boys tune, Never Learn to Love. Manson and family would eventually take off and relocate to a pair of old ranches in the middle of nowhere, and then things started to get really weird. For some time, Manson had been saying that tension between the races was growing and that there was a race war on the way. One night, as a family, they listened around a bonfire. He laid on them the revelation that the race war he'd been predicting had also been predicted by none other than the Beatles. As evidence, he gave them their new release, the White Album, and its rocking tune, Helter Skelter, which he believed was code for an impending po apocalypse. The family begun working on their own album, one of which would tip the scales of subliminal messages just like those of the Beatles and caused Helter Skelter to become a reality. They made an appointment with Terry Melcher, that guy, to come over and listen to the new material. But Melcher never showed. For that, he would have to pay. After warming up with the murder of an acquaintance, Gary Hinman, in his house, 
Manson sent his family to the house where he believed Melcher lived on August 9th, 1969. But Melcher had rented it out to famed film director Roman Polanski, who was overseas shooting a film. Unfortunately, his pregnant wife, actor Sharon Tate, and four friends were at the house. And they all met extremely gruesome ends. The family left clumsy clues attempting to implicate Black Panthers and attempt to jumpstart their stupid race war. A similar scene played out the following night, and this time, Manson accompanied his family members to the home of the supermarket executive Leno LaBanca and his wife, Rosemary. But he still made the family do all the dirty work. The crime was almost more gruesome than the last, and before long, Tate LaBanca murders were national news. Tons of physical evidence, including fingerprints and a family member's personalized knife had been sloppily left at both crime scenes. And with the full force of the state authorities bearing down on them, it didn't take long for Manson's cult to become crumbling down at the seams. By December of that year, all five of those involved in the murders, including Manson, had been arrested. And after the trial lasting almost a year, all five were sentenced to death. Unfortunately, California abolished the death penalty shortly thereafter. And the sentences for all five were reduced to life sentences in prison. Where Manson remains to this day. He may not be a serial killer. But he was one of the deadliest, most persuasive, and most flat-out bonkers cult leaders of all time. Heaven's Gate Marshall Applewhite's Heaven Gate cult beat a lot of other cults to the punch in more than one way. They were among the first to receive national media attention as far back as 1975. Walter Cronkite reported on how family members were unable to contact their loved ones, and that the group seemed to have disappeared. But they hadn't. They'd just simply gone underground, while Applewhite, a former professor and religious fanatic, and his disciples refined their weird-ass doctrine. They resurfaced in the mid-80s using multiple techniques to recruit new members in a highly organized fashion. Another first for what was once a small group of loonies. And the ideas that they were applying were truly bizarre. They believed themselves to be in contact with aliens, and that these aliens basically told them that biblical revelation was correct that the whole earth was about to be cleansed in godly fire, or something like that. The only way to escape this, naturally, was to leave Earth. Although, it didn't become clear just how they intended to do that yet. By the mid-80s, the group was attracting a large following to their website, yet another first really outpacing the other loonies. It was around this time that Applewhite, in his videos, posted on the site started proclaiming the significance of Hale Bop Comet to the group's beliefs. The comet was discovered by astronomers in 1995 and promised to be one of the brightest observable comets passing in the decades. It'd be visible to the naked eye for all of 1997, and according to Applewhite, it was the harbinger of this cult's ticket off this rock. In videos posted on March 19th and 20th of that year, Applewhite begun to imply that mass suicide was going to be necessary because the freaking alien spaceship that was following in tail of the hale Bop comet was coming for their souls, which of course would have to be liberated from their bodies in order for the whole thing to work. On March 26, authorities found no less than 38 dead cult members, including Applewhite, who had chowed down on some phenobarbital and vodka-laced applesauce and topped it off by asphyxiating themselves. Bands around their arms read, Heaven's Gate Away Team, a Star Trek reference that was not lost on reporters when they discovered that Thomas Nichols, 
the brother of Star Trek actress Nichelle Nichols, was among the dead. In a bizarre footnote to the story, the Heaven's Gate website is still up and running and actively maintained by two cult members who are left behind specifically for that purpose. They'll even respond to your questions. So head on over there if you feel like being really creeped out for a very long time. Audre du Temple Solaire The Order of the Solar Temple is a weird-ass secret society who fashions themselves on the Knights Templar and believe in unifying world religions and in the coming of the Antichrist and Jesus as a Sun God King and all manner of weird shit. That's not really what's important. What's truly crazy about the Order is not that they're a suicide cult, but that they're an extremely dedicated suicide cult. In October 1994, a big ol' mass suicide took place days after the ritual murder of one cult member's infant son, who they of course believe was the Antichrist. A whopping 53 cult members died in two different villages in western Switzerland on the same day, all of various unpleasant causes including shooting, smothering, and poisoning. Then in December 1995, 16 bodies were found in a star-shaped formation in the mountains of France. It was determined that two of them shot the others then lit themselves on fire. Then, in March of 1997, five cult members burned a damn house down with themselves inside. It gets even weirder. Michael Tabachnik, the man arrested in the late 90s for leading the cult, is an internationally renowned Swiss musician and conductor. He was tried for participation in a criminal organization twice, in 2001 and 2006, and was acquitted both times. Black Jesus There are people with delusions of grandeur, and then there's Stephen Tari. A student of religious studies in Papua New Guinea, Tari rejected the school, the Lutheran church, and the Bible's teachings and wandered off into the mountains to start a cult. He somehow managed to attract followers, positioning himself as the Messiah, calling himself, no, really, Black Jesus. After amassing an unbelievable 6,000 followers, things started to go awry when Black Jesus started getting rough with the underage concubines known as Flower Girls that serviced him. Specifically, he raped and murdered a 14 year old for which he was arrested, managing to escape before his trial. This would become a recurring theme as Black Jesus proved to be tough to keep locked up. But with each escape, he was caught between the rock of prison and the hard place of pissed off villagers who didn't take kindly to child murder. He was eventually tried and imprisoned, but then managed to escape prison in 2013. And that's when Black Jesus' luck ran out. Police reported later that year that after murdering a woman, he was similarly chopped to death by angry villagers. The Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments of God The Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments was a breakaway religious movement from the Roman Catholic Church founded by Credonia Marenda, Joseph Kibwetir, and B. Tate in Uganda. It was formed in the late 1980s after Marinde, a brewer of banana beer, and Kibwetir, a politician, claimed that they had visions of the Virgin Mary. The five primary leaders were Joseph Kebwetir, Joseph Casaparari, John Kamagara, Dominic Catarabibo, and Credonia Mrende. The goals of the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God were to obey the Ten Commandments and preach the word of Jesus Christ. They taught that to avoid damnation in the apocalypse, one had to strictly follow the commandments. The emphasis on the commandments was so strong that the group discouraged talking for fear of breaking the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And on some days, communication was only conducted in sign language. 
Fasts were conducted regularly and only one meal was eaten on Fridays and Mondays. Sex was forbidden, as was soap. With the new year looming, activity by movement members became frenzied. Their leaders urged them to confess their sins in preparation for the end. Clothes and cattle were sold cheaply, past members were re-recruited, and all work in the fields ceased. January 1st, 2000 passed without the advent of the apocalypse and the movement began to unravel. Questions were asked of Merende and Cabotier, and payments to the church decreased dramatically. Ugandan police believe that some members who were required to sell their possessions and turn over their money to the movement rebelled and demanded the return of their money. Another date was immediately predicted. March 17th, 2000 was the new end of the world. A doomsday, they said, would come with ceremony and finality. On the 17th, group members arrived at their church in Kanangu to pray and sing. Minutes later, nearby villagers heard an explosion and the building was gutted in an intense fire that killed all 530 in attendance, including dozens of children. The windows and doors of the building had been boarded up Several days before movement leader Dominic Catarabibo was seen buying 50 liters of sulfuric acid, which may have started the fire. Another party was planned for the 18th, which officials believe sect leaders had announced in order to mislead authorities as to their plans. Four days after the church fire, police investigated movement properties and discovered hundreds of bodies at sites across southern Uganda. Six bodies were discovered sealed in the latrine of the Kanangu compound, as well as 153 bodies at a compound in Buhanaj. 155 bodies at Dominic Katarabibo's estate in Rugazi, where they had been poisoned and stabbed. And another 81 bodies lay at leader Joseph Naimarindi's farm. Forensics investigations indicated that they'd been murdered weeks before the church inferno. Villa Baviera This item was a recent, later on addition to the list. Oftentimes while doing research for these topics, we come across something so bizarre, so disturbing that it begs inclusion. Villa Baviera is one such case. A former Nazi party member, Paul Schaefer Schneider, founded this cult in 1961 after fleeing charges from the West German government regarding his alleged sexual abuse of children. He later joined a small colony in Chile, a colony that consisted of about 300 Germans, which would become not only a cult community, but a horrifying echo of the past that Schneider simply could not let die. The full name of the colony was the Dignity, Charitable, and Educational Society, though this would not be the case for very long. It was a small German immigration camp comprising almost entirely of former German civilians despite its location in the heart of Chile. Paul Schneider arrived a mere six years after the creation of the community, a charismatic German man with a visage and a purpose larger than life. His end was to mold the community into a sanctuary for biblical values, fit for what he believed to be the master race. Despite his prominence as a former Nazi party member, the insidious acts and beliefs that would be expressed by Paul Schneider would make your skin crawl. After Paul assumed leadership of the small German community, the inhabitants found that they were living in conditions similar to a concentration camp, similar to those found during the infamous rise of Hitler. Authoritarian doctrine was now set in stone. Rules which included minimal contact with the outside world were now standard fare for most cults, yet Schneider proved to be a cut above the paranoid eccentricity of your average cult leader, taking a step further to cut all ties between family members. Parents could not talk to their children, and children alike were to have no knowledge of their siblings. Relationships of all kinds were banned, making no distinction between sentimental and, uh, 
cordial. Adult men and women were separated from one another while children were even further isolated, no doubt to leave himself an opening to continue the abuse and molestation of children he left behind in West Germany. One account recalled Schaefer using electroshocks and sedatives on a lone child, claiming their use to be therapeutic as a cover for his vile acts of sexual aggression. In addition to the insular isolation and external isolation, was required to maintain status quo, resulting in a creation of a large towering barbed wire fence and watchtowers and even searchlights when resources became available. Paul himself was regarded as a direct link to divinity, and his word, of course, was law like most cult leaders. The self-proclaimed prophet spoke with a passion that resonated with the community. One thing was clear, however. Barbed wire and searchlights could not be bought with mere devotion alone, so Paul went to new heights to obtain the necessary legal tender to attain such things. These funding techniques included uh, giving the government permission to use the camp for torture, laundering money for local criminal families, and finally, the sale of legal weapons such as fully automatic firearms and rocket launchers. Quite a lucrative business indeed. Eventually, other high-ranking members of the Nazi regime joined in on this cult, including some evidence that suggested the Angel of Death himself, Josef Mengele, once took residency here to pursue his less than ethical scientific research. The reputation of the community had preceded itself, earning Nick's names like the Torture Colony and a Child Cult. The bad publicity got so out of hand that Paul created a PR agency to create his own propaganda to show how happy the people inside were behind those intimidating, scary barbed wire walls. Eventually, the Chilean government started to prosecute many of the leaders, including Paul himself, for the crimes committed here. Paul fled before being captured again in 2005, where he was convicted of 26 accounts of child molestation. He died in 2010 due to heart failure. At the time of his death, he was still under investigation for the 1985 disappearance of a mathematician, Boris Wellsfeiler, an American civilian who went missing while hiking near Colonia Digidad. On the 28th of January, 2013, six former leaders of the colony were sentenced to prison by Chile and Supreme Court. This investigation is still ongoing. However, as many of the big names behind the scenes of this modern concentration camp managed to escape, it's leading us to question whether these psychopaths may yet again resurface to continue their assault on human dignity. Cargo Colts The term Cargo Colts was first coined in 1945, in print by a man named Norris Mervyn Bird. However, the group's activities have been documented for as early as 1885. In short, they have many core beliefs, such as the idea that the manufactured goods they would receive from men in higher power were created by spiritual means, such as deities and ancestors. This is where their name comes from, a faith that, quote unquote, spiritual agents will at some point give them desirable cargo and manufactured goods to cult members. This was especially prominent during World War II among the Melanesian islanders who viewed the largest war ever fought by countries with advanced technology. Both the Japanese and allied forces dropped cargo ships onto these islands, and the small population began to worship these gifts from seemingly above. Inside these were food, tents, medicine, and even weapons, all of which completely changed the lives of cult members. Following the end of the war, aircraft stopped flying and cult members stopped receiving goods. Confused, they began to imitate the same practices as before when the cargo first dropped during the war. They participated in day-to-day -day activities, such as dressing up as US soldiers or performing ceremonies around fallen rifles unbeknownst to them that these goods were dropped because of the war, and some still exist to this day. Children of God The Children of God, Teens for Christ, Family for Love, or now the Family International, 
is truly the most sickening cult on this list and one that has some truly disturbing subject matter attached. Started in 1968 in Huntington Beach, California, it was initially called Teens for Christ and later gained fame as the Children of God. Members of the cult started making little colonies that they referred to as homes, which were located in many different cities in California. Leaders within the Children of God were called the Chain, and new converts were forced to emulate the lives of early Christians, memorize over 10 chapters of the Bible, and even had to change their name to a new biblical name. I hope this paints the picture for you, and you're able to see what daily life is for those who chose to follow the man known as David Brantberg. He was a former pastor, but within the group he was known as Moses David, then Father David, finally it changed to Dad for the adult members, and Dear Grandpa to the younger members. This figurehead communicated by writing letters, and in his 24-year career, he wrote over 3,000 of them. These letters were known as Mo Letters. In a letter written in January 1972, Berg stated that he was God's prophet for the contemporary world, attempting to further solidify his spiritual authority within the group. However, reports of abuse came in, people stopped getting along, and eventually change needed to happen. David was happy to dismiss many members and reform the cult into something different, something personal, something like God's little fish. Yes, the cult after this point started to delve into the depraved and started to focus on sex. Plenty of these little tracks that they produced started to have subject matter that seemed to encourage sexual violence and even pedophilia. The footage you see now is a bunch of kids trying to justify what happened to them and even crying about it on the newsroom. Essentially, this was a sex cult where the head liked to have sex with children. There are plenty of documentaries on the subject, but I will leave you with one thing. There is a cult out there to this day known as the Family International that had a focus on molesting children. Regardless if it's happening now or not is irrelevant. A dark past like that is hard to hide and really makes one think on the horrors of joining a cult. Hello ladies and gentlemen, if you happen to like this video, there's a few things you can do to help support my channel. I happen to have a Patreon linked in the description, which goes to funding these sorts of videos, as I actually need to invest money into them to make things like this happen. Secondly, I have a Discord server. If you'd like to suggest top lists, talk to me, and hang out with a cool group of friends, you can go down there. Not to mention one of our Patreon rewards is a special roll tier, which will allow you to do some pretty nifty things in the Discord chat. Hope to see you there. Links in the description below.